Hi, I'm Ken with the Mad River Mountain Ski Patrol. We're gonna talk about anatomy and physiology as seen in the OEC manual, fifth edition, chapter six. Boris is gonna walk us through some practical ways to apply this information. Hello, my name is Boris with the Mad River Ski Patrol, and I'd like to talk to you today about chapter six, which is the anatomy and physiology chapter in the OEC manual, fifth edition. And in talking about how to make this video, we didn't want to just make a video version of the chapter. Instead, what we'd like to do is take some of those elements and see how they really apply to the things that we do uh, day in and day out as uh, patrollers. And I'd like to start with uh, some of the chapter information about directional terms. I'd like to refer to uh, page 169 of our manual, and this is figure 6-3. And we're talking about some of the relative positions uh, for the people that we're working with. So let's first start off with right and left. And it may seem simple at first, but I think the thing that we always have to keep in mind in this context is we're always talking about the patient's right or left. So sometimes it can be confusing, especially if we're facing the patient, because there are the opposite direction of where we are. So when you're looking at a person's body part and trying to determine which body part is injured, there are a couple of different techniques that people use. Sometimes they imagine themselves flopped in the opposite direction, but sometimes what you can do is if you're talking to that person, if you point with the uh, arm across your body, then that becomes their right side, which is your right side. And that is one, two different tricks that people sometimes use uh, when they're referring to that. But it's very important when we're talking about a patient and the injuries that may have sustained that we're referring to the patient's right or the patient's left. Another directional issue is anterior and posterior, the same uh, figure. And the anterior is the front of our body, posterior is the back of our body. And one thing I'll be talking about today is some of the words that we're using really all come from Latin, and we actually use a lot of these terms in our daily life. So for example, AM and PM, you know, the AM is anti-meridium, anti means anterior, so it's before noon, PM is post-meridian, and that's posterior, and post, and sometimes we talk about a, a post-game press conference, or we have anticipation, we're, we're expecting something before it happens. So a lot of these terms, if we think about it, really we use already. So anterior is the front, posterior is the back. Another directional term is superior and inferior. So superior has to do with towards the head, inferior has to do with towards the feet. Another important concept when we're talking about these kind of things is all of these things are relative. We can say the head is superior to the feet, but we can also say that the eyes are superior to the nose. So it doesn't matter if it's in the head or a different part of the body, it's relative position. So we're comparing it to where it is, how close to the top of our body it is, how close to the body or our feet that it also is. And so anterior and superior, or anterior and posterior and superior and inferior, those are relative terms when we're talking about an injury that may be anterior or posterior to something. Um, another term is medial and lateral. So in this part of the figure, we have this imaginary middle line, and medial are things that are closer to the midline, and lateral are things that are more away from the midline. And once again, these terms are relative. Something may be medial or lateral to the other um, uh, the, the structure that we're talking about. And some terms such as lateral movement towards the side are different things, or mediation when people come together in the middle. So once again, terms that we've used in other contexts. Also, we have terminology proximal and distal. Now I'd like to point out here, these are terms that are fairly exclusively used to refer to the limbs of the body. And what we're talking about is the position of something relative to the limb. So if we think about something in the distance, so we're pointing to something in the distance. That is the distal part of our hand. So distance, distal. You might be proximal to something. I'm in the proximity of whatever. That's proximal. That's closer to the torso. So when we're talking about a limb, distal is far from the torso. Proximal is close to the torso. The uh, other terminology is superficial and deep which actually is not on the picture here, but superficial and deep are on the surface of the, uh, surface of the body. So the skin is uh, superficial to the bones or the bones are deep to the skin. 
was a different terminology that can be used. Hello, Ken has joined me to make a demonstration of joint movements. We're going to be talking about some definitions that our book uses on flexion and extension. And the book makes reference to flexion being bending of a joint. And it makes two examples. Bending of the knee. Ken, if you could bend your knee, please. And bending your uh, fingers in the form of a fist. Okay. And then it refers to extension as the opposite of bending. Now, I think that is an accurate description for a joint that we refer to as a hinge joint, like the two examples, the finger and the knee, because in their neutral position, they are straight. But when they flex, there's only one direction to go. And when they extend, they extend back to their neutral position. So once again, that flexion and extension, as it's defined in the book, does apply very well to hinge joints, but doesn't apply very well to shoulders, hips, or the spine. So I'd like to talk about flexion and extension as it pertains to those joints. So for example, we're going to make reference to our anterior and posterior relative terms again. When we're dealing with the spine, for example, Ken, if you can flex the spine. Now Ken, can you extend the spine? So the, we went from a flex position back to neutral position, but now Ken, can you extend your spine? Okay, so now we have an extra motion. So flexion means bending the joint, in this case, the spine, in an anterior direction. And extension is bending the joint in a posterior direction because we can go beyond our neutral position. Another example of this is the shoulder and the hip. We talked about the finger and the knee as being hinge joints, just like the hinge on a door. The shoulder and the hip are more complicated. It's a ball and socket joint. There are many more movements than just flexion and extension. So when we talk about shoulder movement, flexion of the shoulder is bending in the anterior direction, and extension of the shoulder is bending it in a posterior direction. Because once again, we go beyond the neutral position. The same is true for the hip. Flexing the hip to anterior direction, extension of the hip in a posterior direction. The, in addition, there are some more movements that a ball and socket joint can make. Now the shoulder compared to the hip, even though they're both ball and socket joints, the shoulder was designed to sacrifice stability for mobility. So can you put your shoulder through its entire range of motion? Okay, so our hip can't do that. Our hip was designed for stability but sacrifice mobility. So one of the common things that happens here at Madiver Mountain are shoulder dislocations, and that's because the shoulder is less stable by comparison. But there are additional movements that the shoulder and the hip can make, and there are two terms that come up, abduction and adduction. They sound very similar, so sometimes people will pronounce it with a letter, abduction or adduction. So what exactly does that mean? Abduction, abduction, means to move the limb away from the midline. So if you think about being kidnapped or abducted, it's being taken away. So taken away from the midline. Adduction, a deduction, is bringing the limb back to the midline. So a deduction, adding to, add, so bringing it to the midline. Abduction, a b duction, is taking it away from the midline. And those movements are true for the hip as well as they are for the shoulder. And the movements, as we talked about, are less extensive for the hip because the hip doesn't have as much mobility compared to the shoulder. We're going to cover some of the body positions at this point. And I'd like to first of all start with the anatomic position. And Ken is currently in an anatomic position. Frequently when you see illustrations in books, they have people in this palm and it's or in this position. It seems somewhat unnatural, but this is considered the anatomic position. So in this position with the palms forward, this is considered the anterior part of the hand, and this is considered the posterior part of the hand. So if we were to be in this particular positioning, then that is how it becomes confusing. So when we want to talk about anatomical orientation and positioning, we have the body in that position. Now, when the forearm is in this position, it's also referred to as supination. And the way to remember that is when the palm is up, you could hold a bowl of soup. 
and this is called pronation and obviously you couldn't hold a bowl of soup that way. So if your hand is in supination and you're in the anatomical position and then you imagine laying on your back, you would be in a position called supine. So this is supination, supine, similar uh, terminology. So we're going to have Ken lay down in the supine position. Step right over here. Okay, so this is a uh, supine position. Now most people when they're laying down, their palms are not in the supine position. Often they have their palms down. So these terms can become confusing. But the way to remember the supine position is when you have palms up, holding a bowl of soup, so now we're supine. The opposite of that is prone. So Ken, could you assume the prone position? So prone is the opposite of supine. And then the final positioning that we're going to talk about is the lateral recumbent position, which is a fancy way of just saying the recovery position. Exactly. So that would be 90 degrees in body rotation between supine and pronation. Body cavities are the next topic, and our human body has five body cavities as they're described here in figure 6-7. They refer to the cranial cavity, spinal cavity, the thoracic cavity, the abdominal cavity, and the pelvic cavity. So in the cranial cavity, this is a little distorting because the, uh, the model has been changed here, but inside the skull is where the brain is, and that is a cavity or a space. And cavities have uh, importance to us because cavities are where blood can collect. And um, you know, as we're uh, concerned about potential for internal bleeding, cav these cavities that we're going to talk about are some of the places that the blood can collect. So in the cranial cavity is where the brain is. The spinal cavity, this is a piece of the low back or the lumbar spine oriented for this particular uh, model. But if we look at it in this direction, there is a chamber in this area that they refer to as the spinal cavity, and that's actually where the spinal cord lives. That's the smallest of all these cavities, yet it's identified as a cavity. Then we have the thoracic cavity which is in this region. And the thoracic cavity is guarded by the ribs on the outside. And there are very vital structures in that area, the lungs, the heart, uh, the great vessels, the aorta, and many large um, veins as well. But the thoracic cavity is separated from the next cavity, which is the abdominal cavity, by a muscle referred to as the diaphragm. And that's a very important breathing muscle, but it also separates these two cavities of the body. Now we're going to come back to the abdominal cavity in just a moment. The pelvic cavity is defined by the pelvic bones. So the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity don't have a separator like the diaphragm, but the pelvic cavity is defined by the bones that form the pelvis. And so the pelvic organs are in this region. So let's move back to the abdominal cavity, and we're going to talk about the concept of the four quadrants in the abdomen. And there are good illustrations here, figure 6.8, which shows the uh, abdomen divided into quadrants, sometimes abbreviated by their uh, letters. So right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, and left lower quadrant. And this is an illustration superimposed on what the organs may look like. Now we have the good fortune of having a model here that we can take apart to look at some of these individual pieces. The quadrant concept is sometimes a little bit um, confusing only from the standpoint is there's not many organs that are exclusively only in one quadrant. So what we want to talk about is which organs are predominantly in the quadrant that we're going to talk about. So if we have our imaginary lines that separate the quadrants, if we look here at the patient's right upper quadrant, the liver is in that region, but you can see that the liver also extends into the left upper quadrant, but the much larger piece of the liver is indeed in the right upper quadrant. Now if we remove the liver, 
we see underneath or deep to the liver is the stomach. And as the stomach comes into the abdominal cavity through the esophagus, most of the stomach, the largest part of the stomach, is definitely in the left upper quadrant. However, the smaller part of the stomach, where it drains, does cross over into the right upper quadrant. Just something to be aware of. Now, if we remove the stomach completely, then here in the distance, which is a little bit hard to appreciate in this model, there's an organ that's referred to as the spleen. And the spleen is exclusively a left upper quadrant organ. And as we go into the lower quadrants, we see intestines everywhere. The small intestines are in the left, they're in the right. We see the large intestine, which is also referred to as the colon, which starts here and it ascends, and then it goes across, which they refer to as transverse, and then it descends. So depending on which part of the colon you're talking about, it could be right lower quadrant or left lower quadrant. But one other structure that definitely has its own specific quadrant location is the appendix, which is a right lower quadrant uh, organ, which it doesn't really show here, but they have a little nice doorway that goes into the uh, place where the appendix arises from. Next topic are the 11 body systems that make up our body. What we're going to focus on today are four or five of them, and these are the ones that are come up in our uh, primary assessment, the A, B, C, D, and E's. So we'll start with an A, which is airway. So we're gonna talk first about the respiratory system. And the respiratory system, we can think about the upper airway and the lower airway. And we have another uh, great illustration in our book, figure 6-9, that shows a uh, section through the human head. And we see this is the nasal airway, and this is the oral airway, the mouth. It looks uh, deceivingly distorted in terms of how much bigger the nasal airway is in the mouth, but the the tongue muscle does take a lot of space. And so we go back into the nasal pharynx, we go into the oral pharynx, and then we're in this area. And what we want to talk about here, there is a leaf-like structure called the epiglottis. And that is a very important structure that protects the upper part of the airway uh, when we're swallowing. So food is directed towards the esophagus into our stomach and does not get into our airway. But this is actually the junction of the upper airway and the lower airway. To talk about the lower airway, I would like to introduce broccoli. Every time I see broccoli, I always think about the alveoli of the lungs. And we have another great illustration here on page 176. And this is an artist's rendition of the alveoli. And this is Kroger's version of alveoli. So we have connected here the trachea and we have the a main stem bronchi, they call them. Now, this, the right main stem bronchus usually angles down a little bit lower because the left side has to go up and over the heart. So often when somebody inhales maybe a peanut or a piece of hot dog or some large foreign object, it tends to get lodged in the right main stem bronchus. But in this little model, we see the uh, the bronchi get smaller and smaller and eventually get to the alveoli. And that is the business end of our respiration. Because when we talk about airway, we talk about the tube that lets air in and out. So we want to make sure the airway is clear of, of foreign body, anything that might be obstructing that. Then the second part, breathing, that's a multi-system uh, process. The airway is part of that system. There are muscles that help uh, create negative and positive inspiration to move air in and out of our thoracic cavity. There's also the blood supply that brings uh, unoxygenated blood to flow past these alveoli and then that's where the exchange of oxygen happens. So multiple systems have to interact and that's the case for all of our systems but we're isolating the respiratory system in this particular case. The cardiovascular system is the next system for us to address. Unfortunately nine. But the heart essentially is a pumping muscle. I don't mean to trivialize that at all, but essentially that's its job. The heart has two halves, the right and the left, and there are uh, two chambers in each side, but we're gonna not talk about the chambers here. We're just gonna talk about the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart, because there are two circuits of uh, blood supply that's pumped. The right side of our heart collects the oxygen-depleted blood from our body, and sends it to the lungs to get oxygen. 
The left side of our heart collects the blood coming out of the lungs, that's fully oxygenated at that point, and distributes it to the body. And here we have a nice illustration. This is figure 6-13b. And so typically the arter arterial blood, which means it has high oxygen content, is shown as red. And this is coming out of the heart travels down large blood vessel referred to as the aorta. But as they're drawing here, the arteries get smaller and smaller, and they're referred to as arterioles, these smaller ones. And then eventually, the blood vessels get small enough to what they call capillaries. And the capillaries are the smallest blood vessels in our body. In fact, they're small enough that only one blood cell at a time can pass through these capillaries. But that's where the exchange of gases happen at every cell in our body. So our cells, get rid of the carbon dioxide, which is their waste product, and then they get from the red blood cells fresh oxygen, which they can use. And then what happens is, as this process happens, the capillaries start to drain into small venules, and then they get into larger veins, and now this is oxygen-depleted blood, which they show as blue, and that returns to the heart, and then the heart pumps it to the lungs, and the process happens once again. Now. The arterial system, since it's coming from the heart, the heart beats and pumps. And so they refer to the squeezing as the heart as systole. So we can think about squeezing S, S, systole squeezing. So as the heart squeezes, that's when the pressure increases in the blood stream. And we refer to that when we check blood pressure as a systolic blood pressure. So squeezing, systole, systolic blood pressure. Those are all these terms, but they're all connected. And so when we think about it in that fashion, things are, are a little bit less disconnected and they make a little bit more sense. So as the heart then completes squeezing and now the heart relaxes, it dilates and that's called diastolic blood pressure. So as the heart dilates, now the pressure is at its lowest, but that's the baseline pressure in the blood. So when we're measuring blood pressure, and by the way, there's a separate excellent video uh, about taking blood pressure here at the uh, Mad River uh, Video Bank. Um, but the systolic blood pressure measures when the heart is squeezing, and we feel that in the artery, and the diastolic blood pressure is when the heart is dilating. So we've talked about a systolic blood pressure. Now I want to correlate our systolic blood pressure with our pulse. So what we're feeling when we feel a pulse is actually the systolic or the systole, the squeezing of the heart, and that pressure rise in the arteries. So arteries compared to veins, arteries are thicker and they're muscular and they have the ability to absorb that, uh, that pressure. And there are certain places where we can uh, check pulses. And in fact, we can check pulses any place in the body. If we want to refer to this model for a moment, the way they depict arteries are in red. You may recognize this as the carotid pulse. But there's a pulse down here that shows in the, uh, the femoral pulse, the femoral artery. And what I did was I wanted to show you some landmarks here. What I have drawn is the black lines are a uh, tendon. And what I want to show you is if you flex the wrist, and once again, we're bending the wrist in the anterior direction, that's flexion, we can feel this tendon. And so if we feel that tendon and we cross over, into a little bit of a valley, right there is the radial pulse. So a landmark is the tendon, and then we can move to the pulse. Similarly, the brachial pulse, I have a drawing here of the tendon that's uh, my biceps tendon. So if you ask a person to flex their elbow, you can feel the tension on the biceps tendon, and then if you come downhill a bit into the uh, this void there, that's where the brachial pulse is. So there's certain landmarks that are uh, helpful in finding those pulses. The reason this is significant is this is a good place to check for the circulation, the C and CMS, and this is the artery, the brachial artery, that we're listening to when we're auscultating for blood pressure. This is a real life anatomical dissection of a right hand in this position. And we see this is the tendon that I refer to as the landmark. And when you go above that, then you are in where the radial artery is located. And if we come up to the elbow, 
we see the tendon of the biceps. And then when you go down into the valley there, you can press on the brachial pulse. We've discussed the difference between arterial uh, system and the venous system. And one of the things we talked about was the arterial system had a higher level of pressure. That's where we feel the pulse. That's the systole, the systolic part of the uh, pressure in our blood vessel stream. And if a person's injured and they're bleeding, there are ways to recognize whether they're experiencing an arterial bleed or a venous bleed, whether the injury is to an artery or to a vein. So I have a little demonstration here that I'd like to uh, make reference to venous bleeding. And I wrote that in blue just because historically venous blood is shown bleeding. And so because the vein is not under a high degree of pressure, if there's bleeding, it tends to be an oozing type of a wound. And we don't necessarily see a pulse associated with that. And obviously the, the more rapid it drains, the larger the wound or the larger the vein that's injured. Now let's make uh, a contrast to arterial bleeding, which is above. And arterial bleeding, what we can recognize is there is a pulsation to it. And the reason for that, once again, is the artery is under pressure. It has systolic pressure in it. So if you see a bleeding injury that's pulsating like that, you're very likely dealing with uh, an arterial bleed. If you see oozing blood, that tends to be a venous blood. Both are important. One is more urgent than our primary survey is circulation, which covers the cardiovascular system. We've reached the E in our primary assessment, and E is exposed to injury. And frequently when we're looking at that, we're looking at uh, the deformity, which may be in the skeleton system. So we're gonna talk about the skeletal system next. And we have a poster and a three-dimensional skeleton here that we can refer to. And there are many bones in the skeleton. There are several bones that form the skull, the vertebral bones that form the spinal column are broken down into regions and they refer to the neck as the cervical spine and they all get the designation C which is the abbreviation from cervical. Then we have what's referred to as the thoracic spine and there are 12 thoracic vertebra and they get all the designation T for thoracic and the lumbar spine has five vertebra and that gets the designation L. And then there's a bone here, which sometimes is referred to as the tailbone. It's uh, the sacrum is what it's referred to. The true tailbone is the coccyx, which is at the end of the sacrum. And then we have many limb bones. The humerus, which interestingly where the word came from for the funny bone is because this is the humerus. And we have the femur. So our upper arm and our upper leg have one bone but our forearm and our lower leg each has two bones. And sometimes it gets a little bit hard to remember which is which. But one way to remember is the, the large bone here looks like a golf tee, and so it's the first letter in tibia. And so the smaller bone then by default is the fibula. In the forearm we have, I think it's a little bit easier to see here on the skeleton, We have two bones once again, and on the thumb side is the radius, and on the pinky side is the ulnar bone, or the ulna. And I don't have any good way to remember that other than just a childish way, but hopefully this will stick with you. Ulnar chop! So this is the ulnar side. So if you're ever confused, just give it the ulnar chop. We have a very helpful visual aid here. This is another model of the spine. And I have this spine oriented the same way the spine is in this illustration. This has it nicely separated in terms of colors. So we talked about the cervical spine having seven cervical vertebra. And by the way, this is the base of the skull. So what's missing here is the rest of the skull and the ribs that come around here. But so the cervical spine is seven vertebra, starting from C or cervical one down to C7. And then the first thoracic vertebra starts. And the only thing that distinguishes the, th the thoracic vertebra is the fact that there are ribs connected. And so that's what's missing from this particular model. But here in blue are the 12 vertebra that form the thoracic spine. One other thing to notice is the curve of the spine normally changes a little bit in this particular view. So the cervical spine, the lumbar spine, both appear to be convex on this side, 
thoracic spine is convex on this side, and once again, that is normal anatomy. But when we get below the thoracic spine, that's where the ribs stop, and we're in the five vertebra that form the lumbar spine. And then we have reached the pelvis, and the sacrum is the bone that is part of the pelvis itself. And the very tip of the sacrum has the uh, bones that are called the coccyx, or the coccygeal vertebra. with our anatomy and physiology review, but one organ system or body system that did get honorable mention is the muscular system. And one point of confusion is the difference between a sprain and a strain. So sprain with a P and strain with a T. Now, in the language that we always uh, use, um, probably most of us have said, I've sprained my ankle. So if we think about that, sprain is a ligament injury when we twist our ankle in such a way that a ligament gets sprained. So if a ligament sprains and an ankle sprains, that mean, must mean a muscle strains. So the other way to think about that is if you damage a ligament, a ligament is a structure that connects a bone to a bone. And if that makes a joint unstable, that's a problem with a P. So an unstable joint is a problem with a P, so that's a sprain with a P. Muscles strain with a T. If you're dying for more information about this topic, please refer to Chapter 6 in the OEC Manual, 5th edition.